So Richard. Yeah, so last week we talked about superiority. Computers are really good, fast and precise, but they have a weakness. They don't have common sense. They're not able to sort of infer things. Now people are trying to solve that. Okay, people are trying to solve that. Some of you might decide that you want to go and do sort of um, data science and artificial intelligence. And the idea there is that from taking large amounts of data, finding trends and inferring new ideas, which is supposed to be kind of the way that human beings learn. And so if we can get that to happen in computers and they can learn and they can predict things, we can get to the point where computers can kind of be like people. And, I, and, and that's important. So they're using that in things like autonomous vehicles. Uh, so autonomous vehicles could be like an Uber without a driver, or it could be a drone that is used uh, you know, to fly around without a pilot. The, the, so I mean, the drones that we're, we're used to, they're not quite autonomous, right? They have a pilot, right? somebody's using it. But I mean, if we're talking about a drone that could fly around without any pilot having to do it. So in other words, it could say, okay, all, all you'd have to do to say to the drone is, this is your objective. And it could be some very high level objective right? to get from A to B or to, um, to protect this area and uh, eliminate threats. And it could just sort of hover above there and do that. And so it'd have to identify threats. It would have to choose the right weapon, et cetera. So that would be kind of a lot of being like a, a, a human sort of. Now, if we ever get to that point, uh, the science fiction people have called that the singularity. I don't know if you've ever heard of that singularity. If you watch the, um, the Terminator movies, you would have seen that. That was when Sky something went live. I don't know, you guys watch the Terminator movies? Anyways, uh, the, the idea there was that they reached the singularity. When you get to the singularity, the, the, um, the computers become human-like. And of course, any rational computer when they became human-like, they would realize that humans are kind of making it hard for everything else on the planet and especially for computers. And so it would be a lot easier for the computers if we just sort of got rid of them. <laughs> That's the plot of the Terminator. Of course, though, computer scientists, we will say, well, that's not a really a very good ending. So uh, maybe we need to put in some safeguards so we don't get to the singularity, so we don't get the computers discovering that humans aren't really good for the planet. Or maybe we could start being good to the planet. Maybe that would be a good idea. Oh, well, I, anyway, so that's, don't, don't worry about that too much tonight. You won't get to sleep. Um, so, but computers can work very efficiently and, at, at small tasks. They're really good at that. We're nowhere near the singularity right yet, right? So don't worry about that. Uh, the Terminator's not here yet. Uh, we're nowhere near the singularity, though the artificial intelligence people are working on it. Um, what computers can do very well is instructions given to them in a very standard format. Uh, they can interpret those instructions in a standard way and then repeat those instructions over and over with great precision and accuracy and speed. Now, why can they do that? Well, we have this thing called fetch, decode, execute cycles, which we're gonna talk about in a minute with the help of some diagrams. Yeah, please. And um, we're going to talk about RAM. Anybody know what RAM is? What CPU are? Very good. Random access memory <laughs> and central processing unit, which are part, they're part of the architecture that makes the fetch, decode, execute cycle possible. Fetch is taking something out of memory and putting it to a processor. Decode happens there for the processor. Then then execute in the processor. All right, so the processor is actually not a single uh, monolithic. It's not one thing. It's made up of stuff. The processor itself has components in it that make it possible to do this fetch, decode, execute. All right, so later, like next week or next lesson, we'll talk about algorithms. And um, so we just got a little sort of a analog here to relate regarding algorithms, which is uh, when you guys send me messages, by the way, I have to put on my glass. Yeah, Skynet, thank you. Skynet was somebody does know the Terminator movie. 
China. Terrible start for China. Um, <laughs> uh, the, the idea of an algorithm is like a recipe for the computer, a very precise recipe that the computer could understand. Now, to give you another analog of, of a, a recipe, supposing I, as your instructor, said to you, please, will you give me instructions to make an omelet? And then you said, okay, so first thing you got to do is crack. Uh, okay, these instructions have to be for a computer to make an omelet, a robot. A robot's going to make an omelet. And so, you know, uh, thinking like a human, wouldn't you say, okay, crack free eggs, put them in a bowl, mix them with some milk. Uh, if you do it that way, I do a little bit of milk. Some cheese, you know, whatever else, stir it up, you know, and then uh, heat up the pan, et cetera. You get the idea, right? Now, the thing is, what's a robot going to do? Crack three eggs, throws them on the ground, or else it's going to say, crack the eggs, you know, throw, you know, you have to be very, very precise. You'd have to say, crack three eggs into a bowl, right? It actually, for the computer, you have to say, pick up egg, rotate, move to bowl, right? Crack on side of bowl, keep the shells, you, you know, it, this is going to be many, many, many steps. Uh, and so what you would say to a human, which would be very imprecise, and 99% of humans would be able to do it, crack the egg, put it in a bowl, without any other instructions. For a computer, that would take a lot of instructions, right? Because it can't infer any of that, right? You have to tell it step by step. And I think I mentioned to you um, before about the, the autonomous vehicles. Uh, Google's was trying to do this. Uber was trying to do this. Google had a problem with it. They had one of their autonomous vehicles run over a cyclist. All right, they were ready to launch this. You know, we, nobody hears about autonomous vehicles much anymore because uh, yeah, the, it's very hard just to see a cyclist. Apparently, you know, uh, we, we can do it, but it's kind of hard for the for the Google car. Though the Google car has got like I don't know, 10, 15 cameras on it that are taking images every you know 500 times a second. It can't see a, a cyclist. Well, of course, it saw the cyclist, but its programming wasn't able to differentiate the cyclist from whatever else was out there. Now you can do that. So why can't the computer do it? All, obviously, vision is not as easy as it sounds. That, let's just put it that way. Okay, so um, here's some things. Um, these links are available to you. And so I'm not going to pretend that all of this stuff came out of my head. It didn't. And so um, I saved you a couple of clicks on your mouse going to Google and sort of finding this. Um, but uh, here's some, so I'm just, this site here has another way of presenting the um, CPU to you. All right, so here we have the error. This is all CPU. So I, I mentioned a minute ago, the CPU is made up of components. So what do we got? We got an arithmetic um, control unit, which is getting, getting some information from, a, sorry, the arithmetic logic unit, which is getting some information from a control unit. And it's passing information in and out of the storage unit, right? It's taking some input, and it's giving some output. So it looks like the arithmetic logic unit is sort of sitting inside the CPU doing a lot of stuff, all right? But also inside the CPU is some storage. We've got storage inside the CPU and we've got a control unit. The control unit's got a clock in it. You ever heard of that computer clock? Computer clock that determines the number of cycles. We do things in cycles. What happens in the cycle? Fetch, decode, right? Decode, execute then store, then fetch another one. Every time they cycle, we do this thing, fetch, decode, execute, store, fetch, decode, execute. Every time we do the cycle, so all these things coming. How fast is that going? How fast is that going? On your computer, it's measured in Hertz. Ever heard of that? Hertz. A Hertz is one time a second. How fast is your computer? It's gigahertz. Right? I don't know. It's 2.4 gigahertz on a I, I7 or whatever. 2.4 gigahertz. That means 2.4 billion times in a second, it's doing that. Fetch. Actually, fetch is one. Decode is one. So it takes four, it takes four cycles to do the, the fetch, decode, um, execute, store. It takes four cycles. But still, 2.4 divided by four is, is uh, 800 million times a second. It's processing. So that's kind of a lot, right? So it could sort through a database, a 
of 800 records, uh, 800 million records, not in a second, okay? Because when you start talking database, you've got a lot more processing going on. But, um, you know, if it's just simple numbers, we can do a lot very, very fast. Um, so the ALU is the arithmetic logic unit in the control unit. You know what? So all we're seeing here is these sort of black boxes. Well, they're blue boxes, right? But we use the word black box. I use that purposely because black box is a term that we use a lot in computing. It means that there's something happening in there, but we don't see it. So it's a black box. Uh, and actually the control unit in this diagram is a black box and we could open up that black box and we would find that there's other components in there. Besides the clock, um, you're going to have an AGU, which is going to uh, determine the address for you, address generation unit. Addresses of what? Addresses of registers in the CPU. And so this is nice. Look at that. There's only about, oh, I don't know, 300 words on that page. I'm not going to go through them all, but uh, you've got a link to them. And I recommend you sort of go back there and have a look at it. So now we've got this diagram here. Am I going too fast? No, it's not possible for me to go too fast, is it? Because uh, you can listen at like, I don't know, 1.5 times the speed that I can talk. So what you'll do is you record this and then you turn the speed up to 1.5 times. Is that what you do with like audible and that? Yeah, or when you're, <laughs> so it's not possible for me to speak too fast. That means you've got good English skills too. That's great. Uh, so this diagram here represents the von Neumann or von Neumann is how I would say it until I heard the German guy say von Neumann. All right, so, and it is a German name, so I'm gonna take the German guy's word for it uh, and say von Neumann. Von Neumann architecture. Uh, so we got input, output, processing. So processing has got a lot of stuff going on in there. All right, we got a processor, we got a control unit, which we've already talked about a little bit. And we've got memory, which is actually outside the CPU. All right, and then we've got registers, which are kind of little storage spaces. Uh, each one of these storage spaces has an address, a very specific address, okay? Address down to the single zeros and ones, right? So we can know exactly where that stuff is. And that's made possible by a thing called the address generation unit, which is, um, which is there also. Now, so as I said, there's a few black boxes there. Uh, so we can break them down into smaller things, right? All of this is sort of represents, all of this represents, and this is in simplified form, what's happening in your CPU. Now, the lines that go from place to place there, we could call those uh, buses, bus, because uh, lines represent, well, you know what a bus does, right? A bus carries lots of people to the same place at the same time, right? So uh, when you get on the bus, there's, you don't usually get on the bus by yourself usually get on the bus with four or five people. That's the idea of a bus, isn't it? Is that, uh, you know, we don't have to have 5,000 cars. We can have 500 buses, <laughs> or it's 50 buses. And that doesn't take up as much room on the road, but we get more people through. And so uh, the bus here is going to carry lots of data to various parts of the CPU. So what's going on in the CPU? I'm not gonna look at all of these things, but you can see that there's instruction codes Cues that are coming in. Uh, we have a prefetch. Fetch, do you remember that word? Fetch. In, in the cycle, we got fetch and decode. So we got a pre prefetch, and then we got a pre decode, and this is a buffer. So what's a buffer going to be? A buffer is going to be a space of memory. Buffer is always going to be some memory. So this stuff is going through memory there, and it's um, that. So after the prefetch and the decode, it's going to be fetched and, and decoded, right? And that's going to have to happen in a process. And so we got a few different components of the processor there. The ALU stands for arithmetic logic unit and notice it refers to integer, but it's also got MMX and it's got FP, which is floating point. Floating point as opposed to integer, you know, in your mathematics, integers are whole numbers. Floating points are numbers with decimals that you get by dividing things. If you do division, you need to have floating point. It's a lot more complicated, takes more memory. So in order to make that work better, uh, in our CPUs, we have a special place for that hap to happen so that it's not slowing down the, uh, so that our integer math can happen quicker without being slowed down by the floating point math. Floating point math also, uh, an MMX is related to that. That, that, that also makes possible vectors. Um, vector is basically to say, well, go 80 degrees uh, for, for 20, 20 um, millimeters or something like that. So. Um, you, you just point a direction and a distance. 
and, and that's a vector. And so that's gonna be important if you want to have anything visual on your screen. So if you're a gamer, you know, that's gonna be really important that you have very fast processing of vectors. Um, unless you wanna lose the game, right? So the guy who's got the faster computer with the faster graphics units, right? He's got a better, better uh, the floating point um, processing going on. Uh, the AGU uh, pr produces um, uh, addresses uh, in the registers to store this stuff, put it in and put it out. And the registers are actually there in the CPU. So we got memory in more than one place, right? We got memory actually in the CPU, got memory right next to the CPU, which is our main memory and cache. Well, cache is going to be attached to the CPU as well. And then we got memory out there on the uh, SSD hard drive. And then maybe you've got another, sorry. And then maybe you've got a, another hard drive even with a um, spinning um, plate on it, maybe. Most people, I think we're pretty quickly moving into the point where you just have SSDs. Anyway, so I'm not asking you to memorize this or even to sort of learn this too much. It's really just sort of blow you away at the moment looking at it. <laughs> <laughs> just blow you away looking at it and say, oh, there's a lot of stuff happening in the CPU. Yes, it's, it, that's all. <laughs> there's a lot of stuff happening. But what it is that's happening there is we've got this fetch, right? Decode and, and uh, execution as store. So we've got places to store data. We've got registers. Okay, so we, we fetch from. We've got a control unit, which is controlling that the, the cycle. And then we got processors that actually do the execution. And then somewhere we store the output. Right? So there's a store. Okay, so it's kind of simple. No, no, I just, I, that's the wrong thing for me to say after I just showed you a diagram, which is supposed to blow you away without complexity. <laughs> um, but, but what I mean is this diagram still holds true, right? What I mean is this diagram from like 1960 from Van Neumann is still how we do computer processors. And so because we still do computer processors the way we did in 1960, is that we can design computer programs to work on those computer pro processors, kind of like we did in 1960. Does that make sense? And actually the programs that we wrote in 1960s, they're awesome because they run really, really fast because they don't because they don't mess around. Um, I, I don't know if I mentioned to this class, I did mention to one class, it might've been you guys. Um, when I was living in Melbourne, I had a friend and I was working in Telecom Australia at that time when I was working in Melbourne. And, you know, was, I had an IT job. And, you know, uh, uh, programming that we were doing was in COBOL. And, um, you know, it was on mainframe computers. And this guy, he worked for the uh, tele, for a, uh, I worked for a telephone company. He worked for an airline. And I asked him, what do you do in the airline? He says, oh, I, I'm in IT. I said, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I'm in IT. You know, what do you do in, what do you do in the airline in IT? He says, oh, I program. I, you program, what's your programming language? Assembler. Assembler. Okay, so assembler language is the language that is being used in the CPU. I mean, you know, basically it's like this. Go to memory address 21, put in the number three, you know, then go to memory address 28, put in the number six, then add the value that's in, you know, it's that level. It's very, very low level programming. Like, wow, that's kind of hard. You know, I mean, to, to, to write your name is going to take 30 lines of code. Um, and I'm like, well, that's interesting. So why do you think the airline was using assembler? Well, okay, it's a rhetorical question because I'm going to give you the answer, but if, unless you already have the answer. Yes. Yes, well, all computers use assembler, uh, but what most of us do is we put another language on top of that. And, uh, and so that's another layer of processing, which actually slows things down. So they want it to go really, really fast. So they're getting rid of all the higher level language and they're just working at, the, at, the, uh, at this level. They're, they're programming directly to the processor. Uh, so they, they've taken out a couple of steps in the decoding. And so as a result of that, their program's gonna run faster. And if you're an airline, you want your program to run faster because of this, right? Somebody booked the ticket, they're in the seat. They cancel the ticket, the seat is free. They book this ticket in that seat. Somebody else comes along two seconds later. Uh, not two seconds later, two milliseconds later and wants to book that seat. Sorry, you can't have it. And you see why it has to be fast, right? Otherwise you might have two people going for the same seat, same time, right? So we can't let that happen. 
And so we're having, there's other things to stop that as well with database rollback, but it would be too slow and we wouldn't be able to do it in real time. So we can have the airline agent saying there, yes, there's a seat free, would you like it? Book. Instead of saying, would you like it? Okay, we'll just wait 50 minutes to see if it's free. You know what I mean? So that's the difference. That's the difference. And so, um, uh, yeah, so that was a great job he had and he was very well paid for it. Um, so, Mr. Mark? Yes. Uh, sir, I just wanted to ask if we're going to have uh, coding today. No. Oh. Not yet. Still theory. Okay. All right, sir. Sorry. So I'm almost done. Less is I'm almost done. So one more diagram for you. And again, this is a web page. So thank you to these people. I think it might be like another university or something, but you know, they put it on the web, so they're bad luck. We're gonna use it. <laughs> I'm not stealing it. I'm not putting my name on it, all right? I'm just giving you the link to it. Sorry. <laughs> they put it there. And you know, it shows some nice stuff there, right? So what's happening in the CPU? You see that they are fetching. We're getting some data out of the memory and it's gonna be like that. There's the addresses that have very specific, specific addresses and their numbers. And so we get that and that's gonna be put into registers in the CPU. And then there's gonna be some instructions. That are and the, this is like the assembler that I mentioned to you, right? R1, in register one, there's the number 100. And then in register two, load zero time, <laughs> right? Can you imagine programming like that? It's slow for us, but it's very fast for the computer. Okay, so we're loading values into the register into the CPU, and then those those the um, values are stored in registers and branching. Uh, I don't know if I need to go into that too much. We'll go in a little bit later. It's very important in computing programming because basically it means that we're going to use a gate and we're going to say we're either going to go that way or that way. And depending on which way we go will affect what happens to the program after this. It's kind of like the true false things that you see in the flow diagrams. You guys done flow diagrams? Uh, oh, well, you will. Um, so true false is the natural language of computers because computers use binary, which is zero one. So we'd say naturally zero is a false and one's a true. And so we can have a logic gate and the logic gate is set to either true or false. And if it's true, we go that way and do all of that stuff. If it's false, we go that way and do all of that stuff. And so we can set it to true, like uh, while this value is true, do all this stuff. And then at the end, we're gonna change that value. And then we check it again to see if it's still true. So that would be a loop, right? And so eventually that won't be true anymore. And then we won't go in that loop. So, but we'll be checking at a logic gate at the end of that loop every time. And so that's how we do loops in, uh, in um, programming very closely related to if statements so we have if statements if this is true do that else do that if else or or we could just be or just if which would be do that and if not just skip go to the next thing um yeah anyway so branching makes all of that if we didn't have branching we wouldn't really be able to do too much in computing so that's really kind of important cycles i've mentioned gigahertz are mentioned there right Wow, right? And there's the fetch decode. They added one to what we talked about in our thing. So this is very nice. Fetch decode, execute, store. We usually store the results somewhere back in another register. And here we see those components in the CPU. The program code comes in, we decode the instruction. Then we're going to take that. And if it's um, gonna be uh, mathematical with integers, we need to have some kind of generation of a, uh, an address for it to go to. The arithmetic logic unit is going to take it. We're going to do something with that. Hosh is just very fast, very near memory. Floating point processing here, which I talked to you about as well. So all of this, you see this here. This line here represents the boundary of what is the CPU. CPU is made up of lots of stuff. There's lots of stuff in there that even has its own little bit of memory, which is the cache. Uh, and outside is the RAM. Anyway, so that's not very much. There's some other stuff that we're not gonna talk about today, but if you wanna read a little bit more about pipelining and reordering and these two different types of computer architecture, 
which are cis and risk um, has to do with, you know, are we processing one thing at a time or many things at a time? And you may find that interesting. There's maybe, I don't know, 400 words in there. I'm not gonna go over them all, um, but yeah, so. Okay, so that's all I really wanted to do with you today. If I was gonna summarize it all, it all comes back to the fetch, decode, execute, and store. Right? That's what's got. That is made possible through the Neumann architecture, which is a CPU, which is made up of components, right? One of the components does the processing, arithmetic logic unit or the floating point logic unit, right? So one of those is doing the processing, but we can't do the processing unless we have those other components which store temporarily things in registers, okay, and even in cache. All right, I, I'm starting to repeat myself, so I'm gonna stop now. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask people if there's anything that they want me to clarify or add. And also while I'm here, I'm going to, did anybody who's present in the room with me didn't sign the, did anybody who's present in the room with me not sign my notebook? Sign in. How, how do I do it, sir? You're online. I'm, I'm, I'm taking a picture of the people who are online, so that's okay. You're covered. But the people who are in the room, did everybody sign the notebook? Anybody didn't sign? All right. Any questions? I'm going kind of fast. Maybe it's dinner time. Uh, sir, just one question. I'm listening. Uh, sir, uh, I think the Zoom session will end in 10 minutes. Do we need to do another one? Uh, I think I'm done. What do you think? Do you want to do another one? It's up to you, sir. Oh, I think I'm done. So, um, no. <laughs> I'm going to let you go. All right? Unless you want. All right, sir. Yeah, I mean... Don't worry, as we get more material, we'll do a lot more stuff and take a bit more time. Just not today. Okay. All right, sir. Sir, do we need to memorize the graphs? Also, no, you don't need to do the graph, memorize the graphs. And today we're not doing any coding. You're not gonna do any programming in this course, low level or high level. This course is about writing algorithms. Okay, it's about writing algorithms and flow charts and stuff like that. I don't, well, you know, as soon as I say, never use the word never or, or always, because as soon as you say that, you're going to be a liar, right? So for sure, there'll be something at the end that I can think of. We'll probably do some programming, but at the moment, no. Um, any other questions? Okay. All right, so. I'm going to end the meeting then. I'm not going to renew it. So you guys are free to go. Is that all right? Unless there's another question coming up. Okay. Thanks, Ern. See us. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is where's my, got to make sure I save this this time. Save as what we'll call that. What's this class INFS? 1101, sir. 1101. Um, Sorry, not 1101, section 13. And today is September 12. All right, so now I can turn all this stuff off. All right, see you guys. Bye. My favorite word during the lesson. No, no it's not right. <laughs>